Welcome to the wonderful world of wine, exploring all things wine with you. We are your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lenzi, and you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the wonderful world of wine. We're your hosts, Kim and Mark, and every week we get together to bring you trending topics and interesting stuff in the world of wine. I am Kim Simone. How are you, Mark Lindsay? Everything is good, Kim. Always fun talking wine with you and our Wonderful. listeners today. Absolutely. Our longtime listeners know that we like to bounce around with topics and sometimes bring sort of uh, fun things, sometimes edgy things, and sometimes geeky things, since both of us have a penchant for some of the science and some of the more nerdy things about wine. Uh, and today we are going to start out with one of those because uh, we love to talk about winemaking and try to demystify it a little bit so that you, the wine consumer, can figure out some of the lingo that might be on the back of a bottle of wine or that you read in a wine description. So the one that we are going to be talking about today is about fining and filtration. And what do those words mean? Two winemaking techniques, as you were saying, Kim, and we don't like to go off on these geeky things, but if you, there's a chance you might see these terms on the back of a label or a tech note exactly, and wonder what the heck they are. To me, Kim, it's all about how a wine is made clean, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you go back years ago, when you looked at wine glasses, they were made either colored or they were cloudy. And the reason for that is they didn't really take care of the wines. They just made it and bottled it and didn't want you to see what was left, you know, the byproduct that was left in the wine. And then over the years, they came up with these two techniques that basically make it look really nice. You want you to drink it. You know, sometimes when we talk about winemaking and winemaking techniques, and we use terms that maybe aren't terribly familiar to a lot of wine drinkers, it can be a little bit scary because it sounds like something new. But these are techniques that are not only coming into winemaking practice in the last couple of years or anything. You know, these are techniques that that folks have been using for quite a while, especially some of the more basic fining techniques. You still see a lot of traditional practices being done in some smaller wineries, but these are things that winemakers have been using for hundreds of years, if not longer. So a lot of tried and true methods, but then also some newer technology that's been seeing within the last 50 years that has really been proven to work really, really well. So let's start with the fining. And once again, we don't want to scare people that they're doing these things. I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for, Kim? It, it, we always talk, you know, we say acids and this and that and wine. We, it kind of scares people. But these are actually good things that sound mm -hmm. scary, but mm -hmm. they're good. Good for wine. So right. we want to start with fining first? Sure. I kind of want to say a little bit about why we might want to do these or why a winemaker might want to do these techniques beyond just making the wine a little bit clearer. Sometimes there are residual things in the wine like yeasts that are needed for the production of the wine. But then once fermentation is done, you might want those things no longer to be in the wine because you want it to be as stable as possible between the winery and getting to you, the consumer. So sometimes th this fining technique will be used to remove excess yeast or maybe some, some proteins that could change the flavor of the wine. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Mark, that this is positive for the consumer and not something that needs to be scared of. Both fining and filtering have some of the same ultimate goal, right? To clarify the wine a little bit as far as its color goes and to remove some of the larger pieces that might be left behind after fermentation, whether they be proteins or whether they be yeasts or whatnot, but they're gone about in two different ways. So fining means that the wines are clarified with an agent. So something is added to the wine that helps those little residual bits clump up and then fall to the bottom of the, the solution of the wine. So in the old days, a lot of the times what was used were, were egg whites. And you'll find the same exact technique in 
professional kitchens or with some high-end cooking with uh, making really, really clear soups and broths and things like that. So it's it's really the exact same process that you would find in a high-end restaurant that's making really clear consomme or whatever. It's a cooking technique that works really well with wine as well because egg whites, uh, because they're a protein, are a really good way of helping all of those things to solidify and then fall out of solution. And then you have a really nice, clear liquid base to work with. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that word agent because when they use it and this was an article that was in pixwine.com and they actually explained there's two different types of agents that can be used to clarify the wine. One of those is what the vegans are concerned about. Like you were saying years ago, they used a lot of animal products or protein-based products to mm -hmm. clarify. And that's where the vegans get all upset. But now there are inorganic agents as well that can be like carbon-based or clay-based. And uh, the biggest, I think, is like charcoal, things like that. Mm -hmm. So those are used. And a lot of people, you bring it up the vegan thing again, but a lot of people, when they say that, when you tell them that, you know, is your wine vegan? they kind of question it. And it all has to do with this finding process, right. clarifying. But I think it also needs to be stated that you don't have to think about these things as ingredients in the wine, additions to the wine, because yes, you're adding it to the wine during the winemaking process, but then it's removed. So you're not necessarily going to be consuming these products in the final wine. But I understand people are vegans and they don't want any animal products to have gone into the production of their wine, that even though you might not be consuming any egg in the wine, you still don't want it to be used. But I'm not sure where it breaks down as far as allergies go. Do you know? No, I've never even pursued that. But yeah, because I wonder point, if touch someone has an egg allergy and a wine is clarified with egg whites, even though all of those egg whites are then removed from the wine, is it still considered like contaminated? You know, yeah, it's still made, it. made in a facility that uses eggs. Peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is the same thing. And most of the time I hear it's a powder, like a milk powder yeah. or a egg powder or something like that. Yeah, like egg white powder like you'd use for meringues and stuff. Yep. And I think it's one of the gross things in wine too when you talk <laughs> about how it all kind of clings together. It's almost like you throw that laundry sheet in the in the dryer, right? And it <laughs> clings to it and then they just kind of peel it off. And you think it's gross? I think it it's cool. <laughs> like, I oh, think it must, it's really cool to watch. <laughs> yeah, it must be a cool process, but I'd hate to yeah. see. I probably never drink wine again if I saw everything all clumped together and how what they pull out you know why is that worse from like than just tannin settling or lees yeah. settling on the bottom sure. of a barrel it's the same thing yeah. it's all the same stuff right and i guess that goes <laughs> back to when you were saying earlier unwanted things like right who says what's unwanted and what's wanted to be left in the wine because the people who don't do the this finding infiltration like that it's a natural thing and left in the wine that's a super so. point that's a really, really good point. And that kind of brings us to sort of the natural wine movement and how much human intervention is too much. And that completely depends on the perspective of the winemaker and what they're trying to do. And then ultimately, what does an individual consumer want? Do you as a wine drinker want something that's clarified so that you can get the full flavor of the fruit? Or do you want something that is showing as limited amount of human intervention as possible. So there's all of these questions that just talking about this process really brings up. See, I'm getting all excited about the geeky yeah. stuff. I love it. No, I mean, it, there's definitely two sides to it. For, for yeah. me, the whole finding thing is I like looking at clean looking wine. And mm -hmm. one of the steps in evaluating <clears throat> the wine is we look at it, see if it's clear and the color. And I don't think I've ever reviewed a wine that really looked not fine that it was all cloudy and junk floating in it in a long time. I don't know about you, Kim, but I like seeing things that just look good and good color and clear. The I've ones never... that do fall into that category of like not being clear really are those natural wines. Some of the funkier sparkling wines that still have sediment left in them yeah. that they don't undergo the process where you riddle out 
the the yeast from the bottom of the bottle and uh, and end up with a clear sparkling wine. There's a lot of smaller producers that are doing a lot of experimental stuff, and and those wines are definitely out there in the market for people to try. They are different than uh, than what we usually see. So kind of fun. You can see that there's that all the these bottle, different right? things out there. Hmm? When you pick them up, you can see it in the bottle. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of settling down the bottom. Mm-hmm. Now, here's my question on that, Kim. When you get a wine that's not fined and, and has, you know, some sort of cloudiness to it, are you supposed to shake it and mix it all together so it's evenly distributing all that stuff? Or do you just try to let it settle like you decant a wine with sediment? Do you treat it that way? Or do you just... I've never seen any technique for that. That's a great question. Sometimes you get a beverage that says you have to shake it and you wonder, well, there's got to be something in there, right? Yeah. It's funny. There's there's a lot more, I don't say rules, but ways that you are supposed to or that you're dictated and how to treat that when it comes to beer than when it comes to wine. I think because there are so many styles of beer that the sediment in the bottle is part of the tradition and has become the norm for a particular style. But these styles of wine, yes, they are very ancient, but the newer movement towards production of them still seems to be only a few decades old where people have tried to revitalize these really traditional styles of winemaking. So I'm not sure that there are any rules out there or guidelines as to how you're supposed to drink them. Because sometimes you can't help shaking up the stuff that's at the, the bottom of the bottle. Right. You know, what if you get it home from the store and you really want to open it up? Do you have to wait two days in order for it to settle? I don't really know. Yeah, I probably would, I but I, I, would I also wouldn't be concerned about drinking it with the sediment as well. But they would taste different. Yeah, definitely. it would definitely would have a different, the, the, the taste, um, a different definitely. flavor and definitely a different texture depending on if you are consuming it with the uh, with the, that bit of sediment from the bottom of the bottle. With texture, I want to revisit after we cover filtration mm-hmm. a little bit. So if I forget that, remind me. But I want to talk about texture. So why don't we move to filtration? Because I think we pretty much covered fining. Yeah. So filtration, you're using literally a filter. So it can be something as big as a sieve or something as fine as fining pads made from some sort of membrane that are down to the micro, micro, whatever, what are they? Micrometers. Yeah. Yeah. Fil- um, so really, really, really tiny pores so that you can filter out practically anything that you need. There are filtration processes that maybe not for wine, but for other products and for other industries that produce such a clean product from one end to the other that you know it's almost mind-boggling how small these pores can get. So there are upsides and downsides to filtering your wine. Some winemakers think that if you filter too much, then not only are you filtering out yeast debris and maybe little bits of tannin or protein that you don't necessarily want, but you can filter so much that you can actually filter out color and flavor and things that maybe you want to keep in the wine. So again, this is another one of those winemaking techniques that the decision really is in the hands of the winemaker about how much or how little of this do they want to do. And the filtration they can do during the stages of wine making, they can do it many times. Mm-hmm. They can filter it before it goes in the barrel. They can filter it before it goes in the bottle, before they transfer, before they blend. So like you were saying, Kim, a lot of people look at it, they, that's hurting the wine. It's hurting the flavor of doing something to the wine. But I've also seen a lot of talk where there's these winemakers who are totally against any sort of pump or mechanical pump being used to transfer or filter because they figure the wine going through these pumps is also hurting the flavors of the wine. Mm. And it's hurting the environment because of the energy they're using to run these pumps. So there's a lot of different ways to look at it. For me, I like once again, it comes back, I want it clear. I don't want it chunky. And when you were talking about texture, I not really run into, even when you see a wine that says it's unfined, unfiltered. It's very rare. There's really chunky, chunky stuff in there mm-hmm. to me. Have you ever seen it where it says it's not filtered or it's not fined and you get a lot of sediment in it? Um, Not too much. I actually think that the ones, so I don't tend to see unfined, unfiltered on bottles except for from California. 
where they're trying to make a point of saying this is a wine that is maybe in a more natural state or we haven't done that much to the wine. But even with those wines, I don't find a whole lot left in the bottom of the bottle. I tend to find extra stuff in my wines um, tend to be French ones. A lot of highly tannic red wines from, say, the south of France or sometimes from Spain, even after only a couple of years of aging, just a lot of tannic sediment. So those, um, you know, those tannins have fallen out of suspension and have created that layer at the bottom of the bottle. But I don't think I've ever seen that listed on a label for one of those wines, because I think maybe it's understood that as part of the winemaking process for that style, that they don't undergo as much manipulation as maybe they could have. But it's one of the rules they have to follow that they have to leave it in a state that that will naturally happen to the wine instead of having it happen ahead of time at the winery. The other thing I wanted to bring up on this, Kim, was when we're taught to decant a wine, Mm. they'll say an old wine or a very young wine to open them up. But I've never seen anything saying you should decant an unfiltered wine. No, back to being my experience too. Yeah, but wouldn't you think that would be one of the reasons you'd want to decant. Yeah. But again, I haven't seen seen too many unfined, unfiltered wines that throw that much sediment. But maybe I've just been drinking them too young. I don't know. Some winemakers will tell you on the label, the back label usually, that they're proud of that it's unfined, unfiltered. But you'd really have to search the technical sheet. And and if they were a true winemaker and did these or didn't do these processes, they would tell you, on that text sheet. So not a lot of people screaming it out or putting shelf talk is out saying that this wine is unfined, unfiltered. If people are thinking about how can we go find one, mm-hmm. I couldn't even off the top of my head tell you if I have any on my shelf that are unfined, unfiltered. I think it's rare. a it's really a, a niche thing. You know, I, I don't know what teeny tiny percentage of the wine drinking population even knows what these terms mean or how they impact the final flavor of the wine. So might not be worth it for too many wineries to shout it from the rooftops that that's what they do for their wines. But, but it's obvious. I mean, a lot of producers, I mean, I can't say that I can think of particular ones off the top of my head, but I know that having wandered through lots of wine aisles, I've definitely seen it on wine bottles. Yeah. In this article, I thought they brought up something interesting, saying that they thought the big wine producers loved these techniques because it gave a more consistent volume. Mm-hmm. What did you think of that comment? Consistency is is definitely um, something to be taken into consideration. And I think that whenever you're dealing with a more mass-produced product, that the producers are really aiming for not only that consistency of flavor, but they don't want off bottles to be in the market because it damages their reputation. Whereas I think that people who are regular drinkers of wines that maybe come from much smaller producers or kind of niche producers probably know a little bit more about wine and so understand that there can be variability between bottles. But I think for something that is more of a mass market wine that for your everyday wine drinker, consistency, I think, is really key. And you don't really want people to have a funky bottle that even if it is perfectly pleasant and drinkable, it's different from what you would get on any other day or, you know, in any other bottle. And I think that some of these bigger producers are trying to avoid that. And a a good way to do that is by having a consistent um, fining infiltration program. Yeah, I can see that. And I can see why they take that the value when you're producing so much volume too, that you, you need to do this, you need to put it out consistently. So people expect it to be exactly the same way every year. So right. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. For more information about Kim, you can find her at her website, commonwealthwineschool.com. For more information about myself, you can go to franklinliquors.com. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. We'd like any questions or comments you'd have. And we're here every week on Franklin Radio, WFPR. 102.9 102.9 FM. Next, we have an article that was in a wine enthusiast magazine and a term 
we hear all the time, Kim, I'm not sure the listeners do, but we want to explain it. What does it mean when we say a wine is hot? This is quite common in if you're in the wine industry to mm-hmm. use the term, but I don't know if I've ever heard a customer say it or anybody ask me this question in a class, Kim. Have yeah. you had any experience that way? Not really. You know, I think that consumers maybe would use different terminology to try to express the same thing. So for us, when we say a wine is hot, it means that the alcohol is out of balance with the rest of the wine. So that when we talk about balance, you want to make sure that when you're drinking a wine and you're looking for, I would say, quality in a wine and balance in a wine, you want to make sure that none of the components are kind of overwhelming all of the other components. And if the alcohol seems too high and gives you, I mean, literally sometimes it comes across as a burning sensation down your throat, right? Like, <laughs> right, right. like too much whiskey or whatever. That burn we describe as, oh, this wine is hot because you can notice the alcohol over and above all of the other components of the wine. But I think that consumers sometimes will maybe describe it as boozy. I know that I've heard that term used from time to time, you know, and I think sometimes people just say, you know, it it tastes more like alcohol. And I think that that is actually a really clear way of, of saying that this wine is out of balance. You know, if you can overly taste the alcohol, then it's not as integrated as it should be. But yeah, we use the word hot, which is kind Kind of like, well, how can a cold wine be hot? You know, right, right, it's like, how right. can a, how can a wet wine be dry using all of these uh, other terms that have meaning in English, but that we apply them to slightly different things when it comes to wine terminology. And many times my experience for people even noticing alcohol levels is in wine is only when I introduce like a fortified wine and mm. then you get people's attention to this is alcohol and wine yeah. because they're like, whoa, you know, the the higher alcohol fortified wines, that's what they get right away. Yeah. Like I think this that's is not the normal. It's when you get the term boozy thrown around a lot. It's right, like, right. Oh boy. Like when it's 20% alcohol, it, you're really going to notice it. Absolutely. Even if it's got a lot of sugar in it, you know, that alcohol is going to give you that, um, that kick uh, on your palate. But you mentioned it right up, up front there, Kim, that it's all about the balance. And if the alcohol is out of balance, that's what really can stick out in, in a wine. Or do you lately even look at the alcohol when you taste in a wine? We actually look at the alcohol all the time because I really? write a lot of tasting sheets for yeah. our classes and we will always list the alcohol content on all of our tasting sheets. So I feel like I have been paying more attention in the last year to what the alcohol levels are for certain wines. And I don't know if it's that... I don't know what is going on, but alcohol levels on wines have significantly been rising. And it may be that climate change is catching up to wine making. And so now wines that used to be 11 and a half, 12 percent are now 13, 14 percent. Or if I don't know, were there any new laws that were put in place that winemakers have to be a little bit closer to the actual wine content on their label. I don't know, but those levels are so much higher than they ever have been before across the the board. The plus minus is still the same one to one and a half percent. But like you said, it it all has to do with climate change because the sugar levels in the grapes are are rising Mm -hmm. at harvest, which after fermentation leads to higher alcohol in the finished product. The whole idea of the climate control is that they need some cool nights, you know, warm days, cool nights, not hot, hot days and warm nights. So they're generating more sugar and that's what's happening. But, you know, originally I asked you because someone shows me a wine, I'll kind of look at certain things on the label and alcohol is usually the last thing I look at because I have so many other things I want to see or know about the wine. But if someone tells me up front that, or at the, at the end, that it's like 15 or something or over 14 or 13 and a half. I'll be, I'm totally shocked. Like you said nowadays, but it seems to be that there are wines 15, 15 and a half Mm -hmm. that is still very balanced though. Yes. And that's another thing. So uh, it's one thing to say, oh, this wine has a higher alcohol content than we would have previously expected in earlier vintages. But If once you put that wine in your mouth, if it still tastes balanced, then the winemaker has done his or her job. 
you know, you at the end of the day, what you are looking for to say, yes, this is a good bottle of wine is that balance. So if they are able to balance out that alcohol with all of those other components, with the tannins, with the acidity, with the sweetness, if there is any in there, and you have a wine that is not out of balance, then it it almost doesn't matter what the level of that alcohol is on your bottle, except, you know, to keep track of how much alcohol have you actually consumed? Assumed, because yeah. if you're used to drinking wines that are 11, 12% and you have a glass of something that's 15% and you can't necessarily taste that that is three degrees higher, you could be, you know, in for a surprise yeah. <laughs> the next morning or, you know, don't blame the sulfites. Don't blame the sulfites. Blame the um, blame those extra few degrees of alcohol. I certainly know that um, that has happened to me on occasion. But well, that's it's, a, it's a good point you're making about the winemaker because I was told a long time ago, no matter what the weather or what the crop that is given a winemaker, if they're still making good wines consistently year after year, mm-hmm. they're a good winemaker. So they're if they're adjusting to higher sugar and higher alcohol and still making a good balanced wine, that is a good winemaker. And that says a lot about the winemaker. So that's what I look for more than what is the alcohol level. And it, it, it does sort of play into if you're expecting, say, a typical Sancerre that's light and lean and bright, you know, it's harder these days to find something from those northern regions that we used to see as really cool climate and would only have like a 12% alcohol level. Now they're pushing 14 and the wine in the bottle might still taste really good, but might not be what you were drinking as Sancerre 20 years ago, because now things are hotter. And that's not to say that it's now a hot wine, getting back to the topic of this article, but the style is can now be different, um, more fruit, maybe a little bit less acid, but, you know, still delicious and balanced, just not maybe what we were drinking 25 years ago when it came to those styles of wine. There was talk, Kim, in this article about that the high alcohol can be tasted as a spicy heat. Mm. Do you ever get that note on a high alcohol wine of a Um, spice more than an unbalanced high alcohol? I think for me, it's more of a textural thing. But I can certainly see the overlap. If we think of eating hot peppers, right? I mean, that we call that spice the burn. So I can see that there is overlap between this physical sensation of heat, whether it's burn from a chili pepper or burn from slightly higher alcohol, and then our brains associating that with spicy flavors and even, you know, maybe not even chilies, but like say black pepper or ginger, those foods elicit that same sort of, I think, spicy heat response on our palates. And we often will use black pepper as a descriptive term for Shiraz, especially, but a lot of red wines. So I definitely can see that those things all together, it might be a little bit difficult to sort of suss out, like, am I talking about spicy heat or am I talking about spicy flavor? All of things together. So I, I can definitely see how one could interpret higher alcohol as a as a flavor of like a black pepper spice. Sure. And you mentioned food, which our listeners know you you like to do. And they talked about food what? pairings. Like food? <laughs> yeah. Food pairings with a hot wine. So you open a bottle and it seems like it's high in alcohol. They mentioned a couple of things to do and not do this. So they were saying, if it's high alcohol, stay away from spicy foods because you're going to enhance the spice, but do pair it with meat with a cream sauce. So what would be your food pairing suggestion? If if someone has a wine, they think, wow, all I'm tasting is alcohol in this wine. Mm-hmm. What could I pair it with to balance it? Yeah, I would definitely do it with something a little bit richer, you know, and again, I would stay away from spicy, like like hot pepper spicy, like don't necessarily do, you know, a a Shiraz that's 16 percent alcohol with perceivable alcohol burn with like Thai curry, (laughs) you know, keep those things separate. But I will say that sometimes on occasion I have been surprised by the combination of something with a little bit of spice 
and maybe higher alcohol than I ordinarily would do because I tend to pair spicy food with sweeter wines with lower alcohol. But on occasion, I've been surprised by like a 14% red with some spice notes to it going really well with something with some heat. So I would say just stay away from things that are that you can if you taste the wine on its own and it tastes that it's got that booziness to it, those I would avoid peppery, chili, spicy kinds of foods. But if the wine itself is in balance and you like the flavors of the wine with the flavors of a particular food, even if it has some heat to it, then I think that those pairings could work really well. But it's those out of balance wines. That being said, I tend to like the combination of alcohol and, or, or let's say the heat of something and the sweetness of something else. So whether it's a slightly sweeter wine with a slightly spicier food, or if you have a wine that has higher alcohol, maybe like a 16 and a half percent Zinfandel or whatever, and putting that with say barbecued ribs that have a slightly sweet and tangy sauce with them. Like, I think that that combination is great because the heat and the sweetness, again, will balance each other out. See, for me, I'm thinking texture on mm. a high alcohol wine. I would have to do something that's a cool or a cold food versus Oh, that's hot good. That's food, smart. You know, because if it was hot, it's enhancing the hot wine. But if it's a cool food, it kind of balances it out a little bit. But So are you thinking white wines here then? Because I mean, this whole time we've been talking about red wines yeah, that, no, that have matter. high alcohol, but it's yeah. very common to find sometimes white wine also are right. on this uh, track sometime. And usually I see more out of balance and lower price points too. And I don't think we talked price points, but usually that lower price point, it's not as balanced. You're sensing more alcohol than fruit. And on the fruit note, I wanted to just follow up with that while I'm thinking about it. Do you think decanting or letting a wine breathe can help a wine that you're feeling is hot or high alcohol to kind of increase or bring out more fruit? I have not found that to be the case. Bring no. out fruit, yes, but I don't necessarily feel like it fixes the balance. Because so for me, still, when a yeah. when an alcohol it, when an alcohol when a wine is too hot, it is not because of an imbalance with the fruit of the wine. It's an imbalance with the other textural elements of the wine. Good point. So nothing's going to help it in, in your. Mm, no. <laughs> what about what about temperature? What about temperature? Oh, temperature. Okay. Yeah. Cool so you it could down chill a it a little bit. Yeah. Chill it a little bit so that you're um you're not noticing the heat of it quite as much. Yeah. And that that certainly helps for me for um some of those slightly higher octane white wines. Like I used to have an issue drinking Viognier because it is a great variety that naturally will move a little bit more towards the higher alcohol level. So I would want to drink those really, really cold so that I didn't necessarily get the burn of the, the alcohol in the wine. I find that with wines that I've left open, if they're not chilled and they're just sitting on the counter, then the yeah. longer it sits, I think the more the alcohol is being enhanced and the fruit is going away. That's where I really notice alcohol more in a wine, even if it's initially it's balanced. Yeah. Over time, the fruit goes and the alcohol kind of just stays there. But yeah. I mean, I agree that the, the flavor of the wine definitely diminishes as you keep it open for longer. And I mean, it's supposed to be that alcohol evaporates over time. Right. But I <laughs> can't say I've ever noticed that happening with a, a bottle that I've left open on my counter. Thank you for listening to us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Mark Lenzi and Kim Simone. As always, you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine and every week on Franklin Radio, WFPR 102.9. Our past episodes are available on SoundCloud and iTunes. Cheers. <laughs>